From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 319, recorded live Thursday, May 17th, 2012. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePak.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Baratunde Thurston about his book, How to Be Black. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm here today with Baratunde. How are you, sir? Hansel Minutes! I love it. <laughs> Hansel Tunde. I'm good. Baratunde. Baratunde does not seem like that hard of a name. It isn't. Four syllables. It's simpler than encyclopedia. But we were over at another location earlier. Yes. And you introduced yourself to a number of people yep. who immediately, as one says their name, the other person repeats their name. Oh, Baratunde, Baratunde. Scott, Scott, Baratunde. Baratunde. What? What happened? Uh, I ran into a very lazy person uh, who assumed that he couldn't say my name rather than actually trying to say it. And and then made that true because he already believed it before it had happened. So and this was a person with a very simple one syllable monosyllabic name, and uh, and he wasn't fun. He wasn't a nice person. As so I kind of shut down in the moment because I've had a bunch of people over the years, you know, try to assign me different names. I'm going to call you Barry. I used to be. He said he was going to call you B. Right. Like I just met you. You are no longer you. You are this thing that I prefer you to be. Yes. <laughs> I am going to own a piece of you in terms of at least how you are addressed, how you might be preferred prefer to be referred to. So he was a, an annoying person. He was the worst that I've had in a while. I've had people who, you know, basically, if you just give, uh, have a little patience with people, like, look, it, it sounds different. And I get that difference is uh, an, uh, a scary thing for some people, even when it comes to just saying a name. But try it, right? It's like... Try the beats. You might like beats. <laughs> you know, try seeing the world from a different angle. You might actually like it. And so in this case, he was not interested. In, he didn't have an open mind. Mm. And so he kind of shut down, which I was like, okay, I'll shut down. I don't need you in my life. I'll be fine. I'll probably be better for this interaction not having happened. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, he would be too, in fact, because I think it's probably his, he's hurting a little bit inside. And all of this within the scope of like a 30 second interaction. Yeah, there, it, was, it was, I wish we had captured it. You know, there'd be a great little scene. It would have been like, we could have had like some awkward actor like Hugh Grant or somebody, and then the camera would like, oh, 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 oh very sorry. And that's the, the, what he did. It's a little microcosm of a lot of other larger issues and problems because it wasn't that he couldn't do it. He can. Barra Tunde. Bear. <laughs> er, uh, say that 5,000 times a day. Tune, iTunes, day. It's attached to every day of the week. So it is empirically simple, but it's different. And he was like, difference, I got to go. I don't have space for difference in my life. And that fear of the you know unexperienced and the unwillingness to try, maybe for fear that you would fail at it, maybe because you're just not interested, maybe because you're so comfortable with how and where you are, that you don't feel like you need to bother. I feel like I'm reading a lot into this dude's unwilling to say my name, but there are people like him out there who never have to say that name. Like everyone in their life is Bob, Jim, Dan, Steve, Frank, and that becomes the easy thing. Mm -hmm. And you meet uh, a Baratunde, you meet a Kwame, you meet a... I mean, these are different, not hard, but different. And it's like, oh, uh, what do they call you for short? We just met, dude. <laughs> And you're already <laughs> trying to define me as something other than what I am. And there's, an amount of, there's a level of privilege, much uh, as well as annoyance, uh, embedded into all that. But the unwillingness to just walk through the door, you, you might like uh, Brussels sprouts. I like what you said about trying new things, because we went to lunch, yeah. and I had a salad. It was a place I'd never been before. Yeah. But honestly, I didn't have the energy or the emotional wherewithal to like have calamari or whatever. Yeah. But you said, if this is my last meal, what would I have? Yeah, you I ended up having like squid. Yeah, I had this squid wrapped in cheese, wrapped in fried bread, uh, and then a burger with a, with basically brunch on top of it. <laughs> it was a burger with a fried egg and bacon and uh, I think a village of some kind was squeezed <laughs> in there. 
uh, wrapped in uh, expensiveness. So it was, but it was good. It was delicious. And what I said to the bartender, I like giving people a chance to like delight me. And especially people who have an expertise where I don't, and bartenders are those people. Servers can be those people. Chefs certainly are those people. Why? Do you, know, you, you have a whole document here, this menu? I don't know it. This is my first time here, possibly my last time here. Why don't I defer to your expertise, at least for a shot, at winning me to, to something new? And so I said, look, I'm, I'm in town for a day. The soon is my last meal of the day. What should I have here? And did you notice that he thought about it? Yeah. He didn't just bust out what they had a lot of. Right. He's like, oh, my, I, oh. And, and, there's, and the, the, the cheaper way to do that is, you know, what's popular here, mm-hmm. right? That, that's actually what the web does, right? Right. It's like, oh, this is the leaderboard. These are the, the highest ranking apps. These are the highest ranking sales. But if you prompt the system with a little bit of input, like it's, it's not helpful, I think, as a server, as a bartender, mm-hmm. for somebody to be like, tell me what I should have. It's like, I don't know anything about you. Yeah. You know, I don't even know if I should be shortening your name or not. We haven't gotten to that level. But if I gave him a little story mm-hmm. with bartenders, I give him some, I, 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 here's what I like. I know mm-hmm. I like whiskey. I'm in the mood for something smoky. Is there something you like to make that people don't ask for often? And then they are a part of it now. It's less of a demand mm-hmm. than an opportunity. So that's the high-minded theory of like the way I asked that question today. Yeah. I just had an idea for a startup. Yeah. As you're, as you're talking. You walk by a restaurant and there's like a 40 inch plasma turned sideways yep. with a leaderboard of like which meal has the most upvotes that day. Like in real time, like yeah. as people are ordering, you're like seeing the calamari or the squid move its way up. Meal rank. Mealrank.com. <laughs> yes. We're going to register that before we publish this podcast. We must. It's going to be a thing. Yes. It's going to be a thing. That's a great idea. Or it, it depends. And here's the hesitation. Ranks you know, have some problems mm-hmm. when they just, they kind of genericize a bunch of unique little community flavors. And mm-hmm. there's this like universal list, but maybe within that there's a micro community or something where it won't show up or there's politics to ranks where, you know, there's some item on the menu that that restaurant really wants to promote because a friend of the chef helped make it. Well, like put up an item to promoted item. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can buy a trending topic on this list. Yes, a pr- pr- exactly. Promoted tweet from meal rank. Promoted you know, meal. One of the things I've always had a problem with upvotes and downvotes is that you could go and see something that says like zero points. Yeah. But you don't know if there's not a million upvotes and a million downvotes. But that's solvable when you just expose the, the vote count. Yeah. The but no one's, no one's done that though. Have, yeah. have you just seen that anywhere? I'm trying to think. I mean, Reddit has, has upvotes. I don't know. Does Reddit have downvotes too? I can't remember. I think I it just think, has. I can't remember. Up. And then Slashdot has. And then YouTube has, has, has like. Yeah, had thumb up and thumb down. Because the, they, the they sh- YouTube shows the the net. They right? do shows exactly. Both. They show a chart. Yeah. And the, what's nice about that is that the first comment on every YouTube video is like, "Who are the three people who didn't like this?" Yeah. You know what I mean? It's always like a baby, you know, farting, and then there's like three <laughs> people dislike, ever, and then yeah. the first question is like, "Who did not like this?" Yeah. Who did think? Why do you hate my baby? <laughs> <laughs> So we talked uh, a couple of years ago, but since then you have published a book. Yes. A, would it be fair to say a best-selling book? It would be. It would not only be fair, it'd be accurate. Is it fair to say it's a New York Times bestseller? It is also fair and accurate, yeah. And it is called How to Be Black. That's true. You are just hitting it with the facts. This is because yes. I've got the Wikipedia page. Yeah, <laughs> and I haven't touched that, so I can't verify it. So you made this book, and the two questions I have about the book. First, I am not black. Right. Uh, although I have people in my life that are. Yep. Why would white people care about this book? Oh, that is a good question. First of all, it's a funny book, and it's a good book. It's a well, not the Bible, good, but it's it's, it's but it is a okay. it's a it's a story. <laughs> the book is a memoir. It's a memoir, mostly. Okay, it's my coming of blackness, and I have this navigation of my life from childhood through college, punctuated along the way of these satirical lessons: mm-hmm. how to be the black friend, how to speak for all black people, and I interview a, a panel of expert black folks, which is to say, black folks about. Uh, what it is to be black in their lives. When did you realize you were black? Have you ever wished you weren't? Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you swim? Very important questions. And for the non-black person, I think they will be pleasantly surprised at how much of their own experience is reflected in this book, which is in theory not about them at all. Because black is the hack, right? How to be is the book. Mm. Black is the variable. It's my variable. It's the one I've been wearing for a while. Mm. It's not the sum of my experience, but it's a very important part of it. The how to be is really where this is at. And the overall lesson of the book, I'll just give it away, is to find a way through your life to be yourself and be comfortable and confident in that. And everything else, not everything, but a lot of other issues that might be associated 
with parts of your identity mm. and an insecurity around that fall away. So it could be how to be a woman. It could be how to be gay. It could be how to be a dude. I chose how to be black. That's that's a really cool way to put it. Black is a variable. Now, why did you pick that variable? I think the variable picked me, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let me... I've always wanted to say something like, that. I didn't choose the variable. The variable chose me. <laughs> that's never been said before. It's never been said. <laughs> but I'm thinking about... The th- I, I, I could write how to be. I could be yeah. right, how to be a guy. Yeah. How to be a programmer. How to be white. Yeah. How to be a Northwesterner. How to be a mm. Portlander. How to be diabetic. Is, is is that the first most important variable for you? It uh, It is a very important variable. It is occasionally the first, depending on the room I'm in. And, uh, and it's been a big part of my definition and, and my experiences. And I think not just for me, but for the country in which it was written, which mm-hmm. is the United States of America, mm-hmm. there are some significant contributions to that country's identity that come out of black right Uh, and and so you know the book was also an attempt to update some of the possible representations of black in this country beyond Mm -hmm. the rank (laughs) beyond the the top five black archetypes Mm -hmm. that might have been on the lcd outside of the window of america you know right oh there's the thug there's the sassy black woman there's the welfare dude or whatever and so uh there's a lot more to it than that my life represents a big chunk of that lot more and so through the personal and the humor i thought well let's try to tell this story because I think there's a lot of challenge, struggle, annoyance wrapped up mm-hmm. in black that it doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have to be the first thing on the list. Uh, a good friend of mine on Twitter, um, Any Vinny, made a really great analysis a while back in response to a Slate article, and she said, black people are not a monolith. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of sits with me for a second, because if you meet... Like you may, if you're a white person in America, depending on where you live, you might have like your black friend. Yeah, yeah. Or the three or four black friends. And that might be your black person, Mm -hmm. like in the sense of that's the archetype. Okay. And then you find out that they love Star Wars or they're a total nerd or they're awkward. Like, like awkward black girl. Like awkward black girl, Issa Rae. And then, and then suddenly your perspective is like, Oh, wait a second. Black people are people. Right. (laughs) And, and, and while we, and we have stereotypes about all sorts of people, like I might meet, uh, like an Indian engineer that works at Intel and I might assume that his wife is Indian and they came here and they're very, uh, formally Indian. And then I discover that his wife's black or that, you know, he grew up in, in Massachusetts or whatever. Is, is stereotyping the primary problem for black folks in America right now that there is just a, we got you all figured out? I don't. I don't know if it's the primary problem. It is a problem. Like the root from which all... I know that that's not like oppression and frustration is a problem, but it's the root essence that you're being pigeonholed. I think... I have to think more about it. I'm not... Because I don't want to... As I answer it, I may come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. I don't want to jump to and say, that's it, because I'm not sure. (laughs) I do know that there are consequences of the stereotypes which go beyond inconvenience or annoyance. Mm-hmm. And they go to the global expectations of an entire group of people. They go to media representation and thus ideas of self and self-worth and mm-hmm. self-value. Mm-hmm. We internalize what we see about ourselves in the world. And if you only see a certain version of yourself that says you can do these things and by implication none of these other things, that changes your dreams, that changes you know what your hopes are, that changes what you might pursue. Mm-hmm. And the opposite of all that, which you choose not to pursue. And that's important. So having, you know, the stereotypes are a problem. Some of them are based in reality. They're sometimes just types. But the oversimplification of what black can be leads to some significant challenges that, mm-hmm. uh, that are quite important, if not the most important challenges. A, a lot of people, uh, particularly white folks, say, well, why do we keep talking about this? Yeah. Why is race an issue? Yeah. Uh, the idea that I don't see color. Yeah. And I... I spoke on a black panel about a blannel a blannel of course yeah Uh, with some blipsters ah nice uh it's south by southwest and and one of the things that i said in the panel that i felt good about was that there is a sense of um pie chart diversity Mm -hmm. that you can put together this pretty pie chart where you have like the latin girl and the black guy and the white guy with blonde hair and the white girl with black you know and you have this nice well that's aesthetically pleasing what a a united colors of benetton ad and it, it may be aesthetically pleasing, but it doesn't reflect kind of the reality of what's going on in the world there. And then people kept saying, well, I don't see color. Yeah. And I said, if you don't see color, then you are not seeing me. Right. 
Is, do, you, do you believe that's true? I do. I think the you know the notion of color blindness, like the lo- notion or the lotion. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about black stuff, so lotion, lotion is a big up. part. Right? You guys are taking all the butters. Yeah, cocoa especially, uh, but we'll work with a lot of other ones. So you know the notion of a post racial or color blind society is naive and I think useless more than it is. Uh, I, I don't. I think it misses the point. I think you skip ahead and you skip over the reality mm-hmm. that there are differences. Yep. And that that doesn't have to be a problem, but it can be acknowledged. It can be included. It can be part of how you develop your products. I think that's fine. But saying I don't see color is saying I don't want to do any work. And it's saying, well, you know, rather than I see color and I dislike that color, you know, yeah. no one wants to be that person. No one wants to acknowledge that that person. Sure. Even the clan doesn't want to acknowledge that at this point. They're... Well, they're kind of a joke. I shouldn't have brought them up. They're more of a performance. But like, let's say, let's say, for example, you see someone in a wheelchair. Yeah. Oh, I don't see disability. Yeah, so get up, go up those stairs. That dude is floating on his butt. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> I don't see wheelchairs. But, but if so you I'm... don't see a blind person yeah. as being blind and you hand them something and expect them to take it without being prompted or you expect the wheelchair guy to walk up a set of stairs, it's denying their their experience. Yeah. Which is not good. Which it's made like, them interesting. It's like denying my name yeah. is Baratunde. Or, 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 giving, or giving me a piece of cake. Yeah. Because we can't have that because it might have high sugar. When you were marketing this book, I was uh, in awe. And I'm not just kind of like kissing your butt because okay. you're here on the show. But yeah. I mean, like the way that you marketed it and your use of social media, I thought was really cool. Because you ran it, I felt, like a political campaign. Like yeah. you were running for something. You ran unopposed. <laughs> oh, no. The world was against me. So <laughs> I was running against... Everyone. Can you talk to me about how you use some of the technology and the social media and the skills that you developed while yeah. working uh, previously at The Onion yep. in, in digital in digital media to promote this book? Absolutely. Um, one of the first things I did, and you were, you're right about the political campaign, first of all. That was my metaphor. And it was in part because of my, I have a big political background. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I campaigned hard for pres- now President Obama mm. and, and a lot of facets of the campaign. And the premise was... A, it was fun. You know, I just, I like applying a conceit sometimes to the things I do, some kind Mm -hmm. of personality and overarching narrative. Mm -hmm. And it just made it more interesting for me because I have to live this day in and day out and just be like, I want to sell a book. I want, it's way less interesting than a political campaign. Well, and you, you, uh, piss some people off because you're like, if you don't buy this book, you're racist. So, and that's hilarious, I think. Yeah. No, and but some people didn't get it. Well, see, it's, first of all, it's science. It's not me. Okay. It's not, it's not (laughs) like I'm judging you for not buying the book. Science has proven if you don't buy my book, How to Be Black, available in all formats, you are, in fact, a racist. Now, we can work with that. You know, there, there's a program. Right. It's like uh, gravity. It's just one of those things that have to buy the book. Don't be racist. (laughs) Uh, or acknowledge that you are, but, you know, Stop living in the shadows. Okay? <laughs> Undocumented racists are, you know, they're people too. <laughs> so I think, you know, the political thing was I also wanted to build something that was more than just me. Mm. And one of the less I took a lot of lessons from politics in general, Obama in particular. You know, here's a dude who tapped into an existing conversation, tapped in effectively to an existing movement. Change, we can do this. Well, he didn't create that. Right. He grabbed it put his name on it and ran with it. Exactly. And that's not that's not that's not evil either. Like he was the right person at the time right. to kind of ride and promote that wave. And similarly, and so when people were, you know, when you're a successful politician, people aren't just voting for you. They see themselves in you. They put their dreams in the the platform of your campaign. And it's not just bullet points. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, this person, this party, this team gets me. Right. I want to ride with them. So I wanted to see if I can get some slice of that mm-hmm. around this book. Because if it's just about me writing a book, that's friends and family yeah, and, and existing fans. But if it's really about identity, if it's about let's take the bestseller list in a new way, mm-hmm. if it's about I want to be part of something that changes the way we talk about race and identity in this country, right. that's much more than an ego boost to a guy named Baratunde. So this is really interesting because we, I, I have no doubt we have a diversity of listeners yeah. and I have a diversity of political opinions. And some people who are listening, maybe yeah. 50% of them, may have shut down as soon as you mentioned Obama. Right. But let's not talk about Obama as, as a political, whether you like him or not. Yeah, yeah it's the, not about that. The concept is that he tapped into an existing narrative, a story, and made it his own yep. and rode that. And whoever, whether it be Obama or the next guy who becomes president next, if they succeed – they will have to do the same thing. Yeah. They will have to to feel out what's happening on the on the streets mm-hmm. in America, what people are talking about, and get on and ride. 
So that, you apply that, that. that. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's politics in general. You, mm-hmm. you have to understand where people are. You have to convince them you can take them where they want to be. But also steer right. it. You don't want to yeah. just simply ride popular no, opinion. No, and, and take them. That, that's yeah. the active part. Right. right. Take them where they want to be. Or and in some bolder cases, tell them where they should be. But convince them that they want it. <laughs> right. So with the book, one of the things we did first was to build a street team. Mm-hmm. This is a virtual street team. And there was an application process. We we used Wufu uh, as our form building software to get people in the system. I wanted people to feel like this book was theirs. And I wanted a core group of people to really feel passionately about that. I'm mm-hmm. one person. Mm-hmm. If I can get 20, 50, 100 around me mm-hmm. who feel and who are not just black people, people around the world, mm-hmm. in fact, that is more interesting. And so we cast the net widely. I went out on a lot of digital Media, Read, Write, Web wrote mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. I went on This Week in Tech and talked about it. I went on This Week in Blackness or Blacking It Up, Elon James's show, and talked about it. So I hit tech communities. I hit race communities. I hit comedy blogs and communities. I'm doing this project. would love you to join. We are trying to make a bestseller. We are trying to you know, affect the conversation. Mm-hmm. And once we got our crew in, and there was an application in part because I wanted if you can't fill out an application, you're not going to do all the stuff. Because <laughs> you, you want them to, to represent you. These yeah. are this is the person who's going to knock on the door. This is and this ask is my, me to vote for my candidate. This is my field ops. Yes, right. There's, for every you know, we we broke. We had field ops as the street team. We had bundlers, mm-hmm. the high value donors, right, uh, which were people I identified as like you're going to be able to convert a hundred book sales, whether you buy them yourself, whether you get your company to bring me there and buy, whether you can put me on your TV show. Mm-hmm. You're in that sort of elite crew. Uh, so with the street team, though, we use. Uh, we offered them, you're going to get the book early. You are going to get access to me, right? I'll do a, an email blast just to you guys mm-hmm. every other week. What's going on behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. How are we going? What's happening with the publisher? It's like a Kickstarter without the Kickstarter. Yeah. We, we hacked our own Kickstarter. Yeah, We yeah. rolled our own Kickstarter. Exactly. Uh, and you are going to, uh, we do video chats. And so I we use uh, Vocal as a video chat platform mm-hmm. that's pretty lightweight, works from anywhere, web-based fully. Mm-hmm. And I would do these sessions with the street team, just taking questions. One of the beauty, the, the technical beauties of Vocal over, uh, say, something more traditional like Ustream right. or Skype is when, when people are interacting with you, like you're producing a show. Right. I take questions. People can submit a text question mm-hmm. and it, you type it in the queue. I see the back end. I pull in the text question, split screen, mm-hmm. me and the question typed up and who submitted it. So now you're seeing what question I'm talking about, mm. even if you jumped in after the question was asked. Nice. I can bring in people through video. I'm going to do that. And the other beauty, and this is the magic of it, and I'm, I don't work for Vocal. I get no money from them. Right, right. And other people can do this. It's not super uh, novel, but they did it first, as far mm-hmm. as I knew. That whole video session is bookmarked by the interactions, by the questions I took. Nice. So I get an indexed link to each of those segments. Well, I can shoot that out later. Right. I can embed that. I can send it straight to YouTube. So it's a dynamically generated real time fact and yeah. FAQ. So, in so video. one of the, so the street team, my goal for the street team, I had very quantified goals for mm-hmm. this book. I wanted to pre sell a certain amount. I wanted the street team to convert these many. It didn't work out that way. The, the math didn't work in that sense, but the street team was valuable because they were my beta. They were my, my early testing. Microsoft, you have a oh, the preferred developer network or something. MVPs. Yeah, they were my MVPs. Aye. And and be, they gave me more than sales. They gave me intelligence from the market. Mm. And so I would do these video chats every other week, and they had read the book, and they had questions. There was a woman in, in uh, a white woman in Arizona, and she's like, "Well, I'm white. How do I how do I talk about this book?" Mm-hmm. And you know, we talked about it, and that moment is on the website now. Like, mm-hmm. I'm a white person. How do I talk about this book? Mm-hmm. And that's part of the FAQ, but it's a video FAQ. And you see, it's a real white person who asked me about this. <laughs> and I could go into that. So that was a ton of fun to get an early warning system mm-hmm. on what kind of questions would be happening. The other thing we did, uh, the first assignment, read the book. We sent them a PDF. Mm-hmm. Talk about it over Thanksgiving with your family. And then report back to the private Facebook group we've created for the street team. Nice. Because I wanted people to talk to each other. Right. And get to know each other. And like, oh, your grandfather said that weird thing? So did mine. Your kid thought this? So did mine. And that's a, an area I don't control. Yeah. Like the email list I control. The video thing, I'm still choosing You know, timelines of when people jump in and out. The Facebook group was kind of like, here's your area. Talk amongst yourself. That grandfather example is interesting because it's like, I'll give you a little insight into white folks. Yeah. We don't usually sit around and talk about black folks. Yeah. And 
even less so with old people. <laughs> but if you sit down with your 100-year-old grandmother, yeah. you can get some really interesting stories. Mm. My grandmother is 96. Good for her. And she, I, just, I discovered this after talking to her about yeah. this topic, was kicked out of school in 1922 for dancing with a black boy at a dance. Wow. She needs to be on the website. Had no, had no idea. Because why <laughs> yeah. would I ever have this conversation? Yeah. It was just one of those stories that you of of a million stories yeah. that I'm sure she has. Yeah, where it's like, oh wow, I you were not only on the right side of history, but like 40 years before that even yep. was something people thought about being yep. on the right side of history. So that's something interesting that I, I never thought about. Like I'm imagining, like that would be a very strange, uncomfortable thing for a bunch of white people to say, "Oh, hey, you know, it's Thanksgiving dinner, and I bought this book, <laughs> How to Be Black. Let's talk about it." But some really interesting discussions and narratives would come out of that. And the other thing was to give those folks an opportunity to bring it up in their context, in their voice, and from their experience. So mm -hmm. I didn't give them like these are the sales points you make exactly. about pitching How to Be Black to your network. That's a little too heavy handed and artificial. Read the book. Whatever you find in it that resonates with you, talk about that. I just want to know what that was. So share. The intelligence gathering mm -hmm. and, and non-stove piping of that was very important. We also, um, here's something I haven't talked much about. Mm -hmm. We have all versions of the book. There's a hardcover, print, analog you know, version. Right, the Dead Tree edition. Yeah, the, the atomic version, right? Yeah. And then there are various electronic versions. Okay. I have the audio book. Mm -hmm. So when I interviewed this panel, I shot that. Uh, on a, with a very expensive two camera rig, it was my iPhone 4S mm -hmm. and my Flip Mino HD. Nice. And I used this Zoom audio recorder that that we're talking on right now. I had that as my clean audio source. Nice. And then I had a, a video editor, Bill Kamek. Oh, I know Bill. Yeah, Bill's a great guy, Emmy good. award winning yeah. video editor to help us chop that up and create moments out of these hours of footage. Seven people. Roughly an hour each. I'm not just going to throw out seven hours of video mm -hmm. un of course. edited. So we splice things together along on this question of when did you first realize you were black? And we pulled some things from W. Kamau Bell and some things from Cheryl Conti and some things from Derek Ashong. And it was a beautiful thing. And then we put that out and asked the public, mm -hmm. when did you first realize you were whatever you are? We also there's a white person of that course. we interviewed on this panel, Christian Lander from Stuff. I remember. White yeah, like. I didn't even think about it. See, we don't think about that either. Yeah. Now you just made me think about when I realized that I was white. There you go. Yeah. So I, that, I remember now. That was the so so there was but the technology was key to promoting and prompting that question. And even if you didn't read the book, you can still come across that on the website and be a part of this world that we were building. This mm. kind of this mm. not that we were fully building it, that we were adding to. The world existed. Uh so that was one thing, and having a, the audio book version, I read myself, then dropped in the audio of my interview subjects instead of me reading all their parts. That To me, that'd be weird. So when you listen to the book, you're hearing me tell the stories of my life, which is the best way to hear it, right. and you're hearing people tell their lives in their voices, in their homes. So was it the original audio when yeah. you got the actual It was from the Zoom. Oh, I just wow. provided that to the engineers at, uh, at Harper Audio, and, wow. they, and they put it together, and it sounds fantastic. And then we did this enhanced ebook. And, uh, and so what that means is a lot less than what I'd hoped it would mean. So enhanced ebook, I'm like, oh, so we can, we can uh, obviously we should embed some videos. We can have some interactive features. I wanted to put like a quiz mm. around the how black are you chapter and have people sort of play around. And, you know, ebook platforms are so diverse. You have to play to the least common denominator because you're not going to make a custom version for the iPad and then another one for Nook Color, another one for the Kindle and then the other devices out there, the Sonys, et cetera. So we could basically put images in which we did, we could put audio in. And so there's a point where there's a speech that I delivered as a child uh, called the U.S. Propaganda Machine. I was a very young militant kid and I turned it in. It was basically a speech from me to all black America explaining uh, how the white man had oppressed us through uh, media misrepresentation. And how and old are you at this point? 12. <laughs> uh, it's a brilliant speech. Yeah. <laughs> but I performed that speech in front of a live audience in Boston two years ago. Mm. Got great audio, dropped that in. Awesome. Some video... And then we hacked the, the hyperlinking in the book. So that you can throw some links in. And mm -hmm. I, what I wanted to do was embed tweets in the book so that you could retweet mm -hmm. from within the book. Like these are the things we should be able to do now because we're already doing them. Mm -hmm. And the book is a step backwards in that on the analog side, but on the, elect, the, the electronic side, you should be able to do it. So we put links and built our own site just to hold these tweets. And then so when you click on those links, you get to a page and then we can change it. Sometimes we'll throw an image in there. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll throw a tweet in there. Sometimes it's just a pull quote or something. 
And we've been able to play around with that. The, the, there's no CMS for that, that the publishers run or that, that right. Apple gives you access to. We had to build a site for it right? and then throw in some code. And I'm not a, a great coder. I, I had my campaign manager who was a role I created build some of that stuff out. But this, so we had a lot of fun with the, with the tech there. I think those were some of the more novel uses of tech in the book. And then the, here's, the, here's a – this actually I think a lot of your people will have some fun with, screen sharing. Mm-hmm. There's a site called Join.me, mm-hmm. which lets people you know view remotely your computer screen. And mm-hmm. it's largely, I think, for tech support and product demos. Yep, I use it all the time. Yeah. So I used it to write my book in public. And I did what I called a live writing exercise. A, a writer friend of mine, Anand Giridas, he gets credit because he suggested I do this. I always mm-hmm. have to mention his name when I bring it up. And I didn't think it was a good idea until I argued against it and then convinced myself the opposite. All right, I'll give it a shot. So I fired up the the software, created the link, put it out just on Google Plus first. I think it was like the, my newest community. Let me just test this thing out. And, uh, and it worked. It worked well. And what happened is people saw a chapter go from zero to thousands of words. I wrote it in a couple of hours and mm-hmm. got a couple of hundred people coming in. Right. The feature to remotely control my computer was invoked quite often by folks who thought that I was crowdsourcing the book. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, let me write something about how to be That black. was my question. Like, are you just alone with people, with a hundred people over your shoulder? That's, that's, that's what it was. No back channel. Th- so, and then there was, there was a chat room. So what, this is what I had to learn how to manage. You know, one, people thought I was inviting them to participate actively in writing the book. I'm still the author. It's still my book. That's not what's happening here. Mm-hmm. But you can observe and talk to each other. Mm. And so in the chat room, once people realized like I wasn't engaging because I'm writing, it's called live writing, not <laughs> just me talking. Right. <laughs> right. People started talking to each other. Yeah. How do you know Baritone? I know from that. How do you know Baritone? What do you think of this? Oh, that is, this is really interesting. They're correcting my typos. Nice. You know, real time. They're asking right. me to scroll up so they can see <laughs> you know, what came before. They're commenting on the novelty of actually seeing the writing process. Mm-hmm which you never see from someone else's perspective. You see the finished product. Mm-hmm. You may see someone in a cafe on a computer, but you don't know what's actually happening on their screen. And because it's a, you're capturing the screen, not just the writing software, mm-hmm. you see me cut to Google Maps, which I did often in writing the book for Street View. So I could rewalk the streets of my neighborhood as I wrote about those childhood memories and or going to Wikipedia. So I took a trip to Senegal as a kid, left a deep impression and I remember learning about Leopold Senghor, a former president, the first, uh, I think, non-Frenchman to be admitted to La, L'Académie Française, which is the official keeper of the French language. It was such a big deal for a black African man to join that and mm-hmm. credited with creating negritude as a philosophy and way of thinking about what blackness was. I didn't remember all that detail. <laughs> Wikipedia has that. So I'm going in and I'm educating myself as well as whoever would read this book eventually. Mm-hmm. And so you see this bouncing back and forth. There was a story about my mother. She had driven one night from D.C. to Pittsburgh because she was mad at my sister who was in college there. And I think, I think that drive was like four hours. That's my childhood memory. Let's go to Google Maps and like plot it. Mm-hmm. The roads haven't changed that much right. from the late 80s to now in terms of the highway system. And so I could be more – it's like pre-fact-checking myself yes. using the web and using our you know, shared knowledge bases and a cloud-hosted mapping. I would, I, would, I would have to go back to D.C. Mm-hmm. and walk through my block again. And this way I could do it remotely. It was pretty cool. It's fantastic. Yeah. Do you think that this is the – I feel like you're on the cutting edge of what people do with books. Will this become the bare minimum? Is this going to be the new bar for what a book looks like? <sighs> Partly. So I'm an extreme case. And I would say, you know, as any artist or creator, you got to have to have some – mind for marketing it mm-hmm. and thinking beyond the raw material itself. How do you hook in the community? Doesn't mean you give over your voice, but is there a way to do that? How do you, you know, push the sales button? How do you take advantage of the interactive tools that's going to keep people interested because that's the new bar. So I wanted to push the envelope and experiment with that. I think there will be people who don't do it, so I'm not going to prescribe it for everyone. Mm-hmm. But somebody's got to be thinking about it, even if it's not the, the original author or Dan Strooper band or what have you. It's going to be the new minimum because we're going to expect more from our stories. Right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a blast. We'll add links to all of the stuff that we talked about, and you can pick up Baratunde's book, How to Be Black, on Amazon, as well as on his website, which is How to Yes, it is, because there's a little blackness in all of us. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.